So uh, my entrepreneurial journey started. Okay. Uh, it started at San Diego State. I was in the entrepreneur program there, and I started a company called Greeks Love. Um, basically, I was reading the book Four Hour Work Week, um, and I ran into this guy at this um, entrepreneur society, and we both had the same book. We're both reading it, and we wanted to work on this product for girls who had um, foot pain from high heels. We basically built these like little tiny rollable sandals um, that they could keep in their clutch bag, and we built the whole product. Um, kind of tested it with different sororities and no one liked it. So um, we eventually pivoted and ended up working with uh, Rainbow Sandals. So that's a $60 million company. Um, we partnered with them and we made custom branded sorority sandals and we helped them raise money for their philanthropy. Um, that business is still around today. Uh, it's very seasonal and it's very automated. So we built the whole company on the premise of four hour work week. So we actually hired um, people out in the Philippines, so they help us with all the data, and then they do all the emailing. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great little company, but it's, it's pretty small, and we realized that we needed to make more margin, so we actually ended up moving into sunglasses. And the sunglass company is called William Painter. Uh, we're not very good at naming companies. We've had a, a bunch of different failures along the way, and I'll talk about those today. Um, but it started actually in a little aircraft hangar. Um, I was on a, a race team. Uh, we built formula cars at San Diego State, and basically these engineers helped me build these sunglasses. Um, this is their very first prototype. It's a $13 pair I bought at Walmart. It's a women's pair. It was like leopard print or something. And we basically attached a little steel arm there, and we opened the first beer with it. Uh, it broke shortly after that, and we came up with a new design. Um, that's us sketching it out on a post-it note. We were really very technically advanced. There's a unicorn in the background there. Uh, we, we used the race team to mill out these steel arms, and we spray painted them black, and so that's the very first prototype. Uh, we created this character called Skip Chappington. He's basically like a most interesting man in the world meets like Ron Burgundy. And um, we wanted to go on Kickstarter, so we started working on a video for that. Um, we were accepted on Kickstarter in December of 2012. Started working on our... Um, our project, I really just wanted to be on Kickstarter. That was like the, the new kind of trend that was out there and I wanted to be a part of it at an early time. Um, and so really that's why we started the company. Like because we were on Kickstarter, we did it. I, I thought it was kind of a weird idea at the time. I mean, it's Von Logan sunglasses, but I wanted to go on Kickstarter so we made it work. Um, we were accepted and started working on our project. About March, they changed their guidelines and they sent us an email saying, hey, you guys are already accepted, but keep in mind, like now we're reviewing projects at the end of your campaign. So you build your campaign and then submit it and then they approve you. So you're already approved though, so you guys are cool. Um, so we built it. Um, we actually got rejected from Kickstarter right before our launch. Um, and it, that was a huge kind of letdown, right? We were, we were really frustrated and we tried everything to appeal to Kickstarter. We sent them care packages from San Diego, like little SeaWorld snow globes and all kinds of stuff trying to get on. And it, it didn't really work, so finally we did an appeal process and we were able to get on. So we we're actually the only company, I believe, in the world that's been accepted twice and rejected twice on Kickstarter. Um, but we were able to do our campaign, we raised about 30,000 in 42 days. <clears throat> and that gave us the money to go to China and start producing the glasses. This is Skip at one of our parties. Um, the trophy says best father. Um, so when we got the product finished in China, it was actually really good. And um, we realized that we couldn't use the name Jackhawk 9000 because it was just, too, it's, it just didn't sell the quality the way we wanted to. I mean, we came with the name Jackhawk 9000 from a Will Ferrell movie. He actually pulls out a giant Bowie knife calls it the Jackhawk 9000. So that was how we got that one. And not a lot of thought was put into it. Uh, so then we became Liquid Shades and we worked on that company for a while. And then we got into a little dispute, a little lawsuit. And so we had to change the name again. And I will talk about that later. And that, we changed the name to William Painter. And William Painter was an inventor in the 1800s. He's the guy that came up with the bottle cap and the bottle opener. So we have a little bit of a backstory. And that's the glasses. Um, I also do some consulting in the healthcare industry. Health insurance is really hard to read and very difficult, and brokers basically use these really antiquated systems where they just like look at all the plans, like they print them out and look at them. 
So we built a software that basically graphs them out, and it's really easy to see which is the best plan. So the one on the bottom there is the best one. Uh, I started this group called Junto. Uh, it's actually pronounced Junto, but I pronounced it wrong and it stuck. Um, it's basically a little succeed faster every single week. Um, it's my best friends, we get together on the top of this roof and just sit and talk about business, we talk about life, talk about relationships, um, religion, science. And it, it comes from Ben Franklin, he actually started that uh, back, in, back in the day. And basically he had a group of 12 guys, they'd get together once a week and they started growing chapters and those chapters eventually formed the United States. So it's a really powerful group. That group is probably my greatest contribution and it's changed everyone's lives. Everyone's in each other's marriages, you have girlfriends that are all friends now and it's, it's been really amazing to watch it grow. I think there's three chapters in San Diego and then Karan and Cody and alumni are actually starting one in San Francisco as well. So I'm gonna talk about three things today. We're gonna figure out what we want, we're gonna discover who you need to be, and then I'm gonna tell a few stories. So most people never take the first step, they never actually take any action. Most people actually don't even know what they want. Once you kind of figure out what you want, you're gonna ping around and do, make a bunch of mistakes, but you're gonna be on the right track. So it's really important to know what you want. Take some action. So business is about people, and it's about mentors, it's about your partners, and it's about you. So I'm gonna take the first part of the presentation to kind of go over what you guys want and uh, what you're interested in. So take about two minutes and I want you guys to describe your ideal day in the future. So where are you? You know, what are you doing? What sports are you doing? Who are you with? What's your family like? So take a few minutes and just write out that day. So start at 8 a.m. or whatever you wake up. Maybe your alarm goes off, like what country are you in? You know, what kind of job do you have? Are you working? Do you have your own company? Do you have passive income? Kind of take two minutes and just write it out. It's hard to write out your entire perfect day in just two minutes, but spend some time and really think about what you want. Like, what do you want to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? Maybe it is working at a, at a nine-to-five job, but you come home and you have the most amazing family life and you hang out with your kids. It's important to really understand that because it's gonna help guide what you do next. So what skills does that person have? So take a moment and kind of write down, like, are they a good speaker? Do they, are they artistic? Do they focus on logistics? Are they business oriented? Like what skills does that person have? So when I was going through this process, I wanted to gain those skills. So I got really involved on campus when I was at San Diego State. And a lot of these actually ended up paying huge dividends. And you can't really connect the dots when you're, when you're out, out doing those, but looking back, the Formula Race team, those are the guys that built our sunglasses. The Entrepreneur Society is where I met my business partner. Delta Sigma Pi, that's partially why I'm here. Uh, the Business Alumni Network, I was the president of the Alumni Association and that gave me delegation skills. And all these skills led up to the person I am today. And if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you need to figure out who you need to become and start working on those skills. So if you can break some of those steps down, right? So let's work backward from your ideal day and go backwards and go, what steps would it take to get to that point? What do you need to be working on to get there? So mine was sort of basically waking up in Argentina and having passive income, kind of stealing a little bit from Tim Ferriss, you know, kind of living that exciting life in a different country with friends. And so I wrote out some steps and mine was basically start a business, it's gonna get you the cash flow to get there. And basically I'm on step nine right now, so I'm making progress. Once you write things down, it's amazing how your life starts to flow. And it's only only 13 steps, so that, those are mine. So I don't really expect you guys to do it today, but take some time and really think about where you're going and then how can you get there and who you need to become to get there. And it starts with values. So these are some terminal values that you can choose from. I want you guys to choose five. Knowing yourself is really important. So for me, mine was freedom. Let's see. Self-respect. 
some of those things were, were on my list. Happiness, I think, was one. So it's just understanding what values you really crave is going to help you in guiding and deciding on what business you're going to do. Also, you want to understand your uh, instrumental values. So if you could pick three of these, do so now. Okay, so step one for me back in the day was to find mentors, because mentors can help clear the way all of all these landmines you're gonna run into. So I like to do three coffees a week with mentors. So that's emailing different people and basically saying, hey, you're really interesting. I'm an aspiring entrepreneur. You're a CEO. I'm really, really interested in getting to know you and learning what your challenges were along the way. I bet it's a super exciting story. Can I bring you coffee to your office and sit down for 15 minutes? So I basically did that with 200 guys probably and met a bunch of amazing people and learned a ton. These are some of the mentors we have now that are advising William Painter. Um, like Volcom is a good one, Cole Banker, the CEOs of those companies are on board. So it's great to have those guys. They really help a lot. And these guys have definitely saved the company a couple of times. <clears throat> so partners. Let me talk about partners a little bit. So I like to think of partners like puzzle pieces. Uh, you need them to fulfill some capabilities that you are missing. But a lot of people, I think, are over eager to go out and find a partner just because they feel like they need one. Uh, the, my definition of a partner is you are in a constant state of awe at what they do. It's literally impossible for you to do what they do. Um, I'm going to go through some of our partners. So I'm up there on the left. I basically do nothing. Uh, Pat is a marketing genius. He is huge in promotions. He's really good at branding. Um, Zach is our systems guy, so he runs all the different systems and he kind of saves the day when I go and create a mess. And Dempsey is sort of our, he's kind of like our medic in the field. He's always fixing little problems that are coming up and he's like our admin, legal, investor relations guy. So this is actually the first picture I have of everyone together. We're, we're, we live in different areas, some of us, and so it's hard to get together. This was actually taken on Thursday, um, so like a couple days ago. Dempsey's on crutches because he fell off a roof, hanging out with a mannequin on top of American Apparel and TV, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we're just a bunch of guys. Sometimes I feel like partnerships is a lot like being in 300, like a Spartan warrior. Uh, you work so hard and you have these emotional highs and lows. Like entrepreneurship is a roller coaster for sure. And you need a partner to be there when you're emotionally down. I think all of us as entrepreneurs are really optimistic, but it's so important to have someone that's got your back. So a lot of times, this is a very typical conversation between Zach and I. We uh, will be down, you know, I'm just super down on something and something's not going right. And then like, he's like, dude, I'm just so down too. It's just, it's so frustrating. And then we're like, yeah, but. Let's just keep going, just keep going, keep going, and we, we just keep moving. And there's us, uh, that's at a onesie party at Sundance Film Festival with the sunglasses. Um, but we, yeah, we've helped each other through a ton of battles, and it's, it's, it's really like a, a marriage in a lot of ways. You, you have to trust them 100%. So a tactic that we always use in all of our companies is sell before you buy. And basically that means make a mock-up and try and get it sold. So with Greeks Love, we actually, that's a Photoshop sandal of um, the Tri-Delta. And we basically came up with a little bit fancier one and sent it out to all these different chapters and said, hey, this is super secret and we're just working on a deal with Rainbow. Like, is this something your chapter's interested in? And like, it was like a 98% positive response. So we knew we had something and basically we had all the revenue coming in before we even produced the product. This was actually a Photoshop mock-up I did before we had any kind of product. And uh, this is what got us on Kickstarter originally, as terrible of an idea as it is. There's our uh, first prototype uh, taken on, that photo was taken on my kitchen table in my house. So it's always good to have an unfair advantage when you're going into business. So with Greeks Love, it was, we were partnered with a $60 million brand going into the fraternity and sorority space, which is like a really fragmented market. So we knew we had a huge brand equity and we were able to get an exclusive deal there. So that was an unfair advantage that no one else could really do. 
with William Painter, we have patents. So we have four patents, and that prohibits big brands from coming in and copying us, or at least hopefully prevent, prevents them from doing that. These are some of our patents and patent drawings. Patents are expensive. <laughs> so there's gonna be moments where you're gonna lose everything. And this is really the hard part of entrepreneurship. You have these really, really bad days. And uh, a little story is with Greeks Love. So we'd been working with the VP of sales uh, at Rainbow for about two years, like designing the business. Basically, we were coming up with something that was gonna work for them. And so we, we structured the deal, we had him on board, we had their uh, logistics team on board, and the, the final meeting was with Sparky, uh, the CEO of Rainbow, and he's kind of like always traveling the world, stand up paddle boarding, so it was really hard to get a meeting with him. It took us about a year to get the meeting. So we're on the way to the meeting, I was actually working at my current job in Ventura, driving down to that meeting, while other partners were driving up from San Diego to San Clemente, and I get a call from the VP of sales saying, hey, you know, we just had a meeting, uh, Sparky wants to change everything, just wanted to give you a heads up, like you might get blindsided. So we go in this meeting and I'm, I'm calling all my mentors on the way down because I got like two hours to get to the meeting. I'm like, hey guys, like what do I do? Like do I cancel the meeting, like figure out what the hell's wrong and then come back? And I couldn't do that because it took a year to get the meeting so I just had to go. So we go in and we're sitting down in their corporate headquarters and the CEO walks in and he's just like, this business is shit. Like, I don't like it. I don't like anything about it. It doesn't work. My logistics team can't do it. Like, it's going to take too many labor, like, too much labor, all those other problems. And I was like, hey, can I say something? He's like, no, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. And we're just like, I just look at my partners and they're completely white. Just like, oh my God, we spent two years on this. Like, it's over. And I was just like, can I say something? And finally he goes, yeah, like, what do you want? And I was like, you're like looking at this the wrong way. Like, you're thinking of us like sales reps. We're not sales reps, we're Nordstrom's. And he's just like, oh, you're Nordstrom's. Like, and basically that was a, a way of systematizing his business where it didn't have to, like, he didn't have to do anything except ship product. And so he's like, yeah, that's great, go do it. Like one sentence changed the whole company. And we're walking out and like literally dancing in the parking lot because we just scored the deal. And he like throws a sandal at us um, and says like, that's what, that, this is what they're gonna look like. And it was some university sandal. But, we have that sandal that we keep now as like a symbol of like, you can lose everything and then get it back all of a sudden. <clears throat> the biggest challenges of, often lead to your greatest successes. And I feel like as an entrepreneur, you have to go through those moments and they really, really suck. And that was with um, kind of the name changes. We've been really bad at that. So we started with Jackhawk 9000. It was kind of a joke. We went on Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a very like engineering driven community and we were, we kind of wanted to be like more fun and like different. So here's like one of our little ads that we made. It's like, is more, do they work? Is Morgan Freeman God? Like there's a little prototype down there of the SR-71, little notch on the wing. Like we just did all these like fun things trying to like make us different, but when we got the product, it was just too good to be like that, essentially. So we came with Liquid Shades and Liquid Shades was great. Basically it ended up, the way we led into this mistake was a, a not taking enough time and hiring bad lawyers. Uh, so we came, the manufacturing plant in China requires a trademark and they needed it like right away. So I went to Dempsey and was like, hey, I need this like right now, like give me a, give me a trademark. So he went in just like hired some guy off the internet and like, you know, we spent like 600 bucks on him and he went and did the trademark stuff. And there's another company called basically like Liquid Eye Pro or something like that. They're out of Arizona. And the lawyer was like, hey, you know, like there's this other company, I think you guys are gonna be fine, like just keep going. So we went ahead and went with it. I got a call in, I don't know, like, just, like right around Christmas, like right before Christmas, basically from like our team saying, hey, we just got this like really, really gnarly cease and desist. Like they're gonna sue us, like you gotta like do something. And I was on my family vacation, like snowboarding, and I was just like, oh crap, like, gotta fix this like right now or like we're done. And so I actually called the guy and just talked to him and wanted to make it, wanted to make it as human as possible so there's no like lawyers involved. It's like, hey, like we're a bunch of kids, like we're, we messed up, we hired the wrong guy, like we're gonna fix it, like I'll shut everything down right now, like I'll Photoshop some new mock-ups for you, like please don't sue us. <laughs> and so basically we had to go through that transition um, we knew in December, we actually switched the brand over in April. So we had four months of like, 
basically hitting the brakes, redoing everything, and you're doing everything, like new product, going to China again, doing all this stuff, like it's, it was a lot of work to get it fixed, and it was really hard to not tell anyone. So you guys were actually like the first to really know that that's what happened. Um, but that name change to William Painter actually was hugely beneficial. It makes us a higher end brand. It has a backstory. Now all these magazines want to cover it. Before it was like we were really pigeonholed into like action sports. So it's done, it's been a huge, huge success for us, but it was so painful, like so painful, because you can't really market when you know you're gonna change the name and like, so we, we, we had all these long leads for big magazines and we had to just like hold off because we didn't have the new product. We couldn't even show them because we didn't have a logo. Like it was a bunch of like just terrible things. But we made it through it and now it's just really taking off. So that, that challenge actually ended up being a huge win for us. So money makes you lazy. So uh, the, a lot of entrepreneurs will tell you, you know, especially Silicon Valley guys, it's like go out, get your VC round, go raise a couple million, like run as hard as you can, and like maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Uh, we, we decided to do the opposite. We were just like, hey, let's just build a really slow, profitable company, and like we'll keep it really small, and we're just gonna make a lot of money. Like that's what we're gonna do, and like that proves it's a successful business, and then we can go and grow. And uh, one example of this was uh, PR. So a PR company typically charges like five to 10 grand a month. They promise you certain leads, into magazines and they kind of do your PR for you. Uh, we didn't have the money to do five to $10,000 a month. So we basically packaged up these beer bottles um, and we shipped them to every major magazine and we had a massive response. Um, there's uh, Zach getting one of the packages ready. And this photo is really interesting because you can see this is our like working out of an apartment. There's boxes in the background stacked to the ceiling. There's a uh, Lagunitas beer, which now sponsors us, so we have like beer for life. And then uh, uh, there's a there's a card there that says uh, "Go Ape Shit," and that one went to Maxim, which which actually worked. We, they featured us on their website. So this is some of the response that we got from shipping those packages. We spent about a thousand dollars in shipping beer legally across the United States, and it yielded us a ton of return. So you get to see there's Maxim. We were in Us Weekly, so every grocery store in the country. Cosmopolitan, um, recently we were on the Chive, and uh, Yahoo, and, and whatnot. And basically, these magazines actually don't really provide that much revenue like you think they would, but they give you so much credibility, like you now become a real brand, and then you can start advertising that you've been in those things. So Transworld Business got us a, a partnership with Burton, so now we're in Burton's flagship stores, and really like starting to grow that, and then you keep leveraging those uh, credibility indicators to help grow the brand. Execution. So basically Zach and I, we work with frogs and it's a, there's a book called Eat That Frog. It's basically like get your most ugly task out of the day first when you first wake up. So um, eating a frog is very uncomfortable um, and you've got to get it done though. And once you do, your day feels so much better. You'll, you'll just feel incredible once you've accomplished your most difficult task. It's not always business related. Sometimes like for me, one time it was going to visit my grandparents in the Midwest. Like that was something that was really weighing on me and once I did it, I felt so much better. So every day we wake up, we write down three frogs and we tackle those frogs immediately. We don't do email, we don't talk to each other, we don't do anything until those are done. And that really pushes things forward and you feel awesome about your day. If you're done with the most difficult things to do for the day by 10 a.m., you're stoked on life. And it allows you to actually work less and work smarter and feel better about your life. And you can actually go to the gym and go out and do other fun things when you feel like you've accomplished your big goals. Work-life balance. So Zach has always been the proponent of work-life balance, right? So he's always like separate everything out. You need to work and then you need to go to the gym and then you need to hang out with your family and then you need to go do this other stuff. Like separate every quadrant of your life out. And I'm actually a proponent of blending. So blending is where you sort of have business and all those tasks kind of run together. So with Junto, it's like, okay, like how can I get all my friends together and talk about business and move business forward? So now it's like I'm meeting with 10 or 12 guys at one time and we're usually doing fun stuff and learning and growing the business. Or, you know, we're doing um, fun events out at Sundance Film Festival. Like you're getting to go do your vacations, but you're also working. Like trying to combine those things together, and that's why it's so important when you guys wrote down your ideal day, 
It's like really figure that out because you can design your business to really move that direction, right? So I wanted William Painter to be about bringing cool people together and, and living amazing experiences and being more than meets the eye. So every single one of you guys in here are more than meets the eye. There's something amazing about you. You're all here, you're all motivated. And that's what we really want William Painter to be because the glasses are more than meets the eye, but the people wearing them are also more than meets the eye. So really design your company to live the life that you want to live. That's uh, riding horses with the founder of 24 Hour Fitness and drinking scotch at his castle. Um, that was a great time. We we're talking about business the whole time and he's become a great mentor and he's really guiding us through a lot of those processes. It's work but it's also play. It's really like blending. This is a, a nightclub in Shanghai or somewhere in China with uh, some of our manufacturing partners. So it's drinking, eating, and going out and clubbing with your partners that are going to help you manufacture your product. And that's how business is done in China. You have to spend time with them, you become family with them, and uh, it's, it's a, just a way of doing business, but it's also just blending your life together. This is last week. Um, we got like an insane amount of orders in, and so we were literally, our, our warehouse got overloaded, and so we were shipping all of our inventory in my Honda Civic, and that's Dempsey with a plate of fried rice below, below him. I mean, it's still a startup struggle, and we, we haven't, we've been very, very lean, like, very lean. We haven't paid ourselves. We actually paid ourselves for the first time on Thursday. It's been a year and a half. So we, we wanted to just be really profitable and have the money go into growing the company. So let's break into Q&A. I have a bunch of different topics up there. And who wants to kick it off? Uh, so you mentioned a warehouse. Um, are you fulfilling your own orders? Or are you going like having fulfillment center do that? Uh, yeah, we have a warehouse. Um, we did a quick short-term partnership with a buddy who had extra space in his warehouse, and it worked super well. Like, they just shipped everything out. We don't even know when product's going out. Um, that warehouse became overloaded when we started selling, like, 100 pairs a day. They were just, like, couldn't handle it. So now we're moving into a much bigger warehouse that can handle all those shipping requirements, and it's fully automated. They log into our systems. They ship it out. It's done. Mm hmm yeah, it makes, it makes us focus on growing the business as opposed to shipping boxes. Although I've shipped a lot of boxes, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, ship a, they charge a little bit for storage and a little bit for charging ship, or for shipping stuff out. Yeah. Question? Right. I think the 80-20 rule always applies, right? You're going to have, of those 200 people, like, some of them sucked. They weren't cool. Like, some of them didn't have good values. Like, some of them just didn't have the time of day, you know, they didn't care. And so you whittled it down to a certain amount. I try and pick an area of my life and then find a mentor for that, that cause. So I, I like racing in cars, so I have a car racing mentor. And I hang out with him and we talk cars all the time. And then you have, you know, a real estate mentor for that. So I went out and got one for that. One for relationships, one's for spirituality. Like really start to build this advisory team for yourself. And those guys like have helped so much. So you said you were going through like this whole process for a year and a half and how did you like stay afloat? Like how did you get all the funds? Like you obviously didn't pay yourself yeah. is what I'm saying. Like mm -hmm. how did you raise all the funds or like was it out of your pocket? Like yeah. what kind of yeah. things did you do? So I mean we really, we try and do things at a, with a minimum viable product, right? So it's like let's build this business as cheap as humanly possible. We, uh, we built the company for... Of, we filmed a video for Kickstarter, that was about 2,000. We filed all the patents, that was like 7,000. And I think we built a prototype for about 3,000. So that, that was the cost of the business, right? And I, I funded that. Um, and basically, I've been working my whole life. Once you have these like steps for your life, that's like getting your ideal day, then you can work backwards, right? So I knew I was going to leave at my job at some point. And so I was working and saving and being really cheap to like save up enough money so I could go and like live that dream. And so I had, basically I was relying on savings and um, did, did some consulting along the way. Uh, it, I would recommend staying at your job as long as you can. The time to leave your job is when you have to work on your company more than you have to work at your job. Like I was torn and I had so much guilt because 
I was literally working like all day on my company instead of my job and like that's not fair to my employer. So I stayed there as long as I could but at some point I was just like, I felt so guilty because I needed to work on my company and I needed to work on my job and so I just would freak out about both and not do anything. So <laughs> I finally had to leave. Um, yeah, and I felt so much better when I left but um, I did a lot of consulting stuff. I wouldn't recommend like going and getting like a, a waiter job or something in the meantime. I think you should try and get a job if you have to, if you need to stay alive, to get something that's gonna help build skills along the way that's gonna be in line with your startup. So I did consulting, so I go into businesses and help them fix everything and then execute on a product. So I'm still doing what I do at my job, um, but I get to do it with them as well. And it keeps refining skills and you see all the mistakes that their company has as well. Uh, the the transition to liquid shades and hiring bad lawyers has been the biggest mistake we've we've had. That probably cost us fifty thousand um, dollars, which is a lot of money for a small startup. And we had to basically shut everything down for four months. So that was brutal. Um, we now use uh, a firm called Mince Levin. They're like a top tier firm. So we use really good lawyers now, and that's changed the way we do business. I mean, it sucks to pay lawyers, but you have to. You're like you will get screwed if you don't. So that's one thing that we do spend money on. Okay, uh, the businessy twist of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, basically, so um, one of my buddies, he's in Junto. He uh, built a company called Lifeproof. They just sold the OtterBox for 350 million. So he's now retired. He's 26. Um, he <laughs> he now joined our board, and so he's been helping us. And I'm still learning a ton. So he he comes in and walks us through all these processes of how he built that company. And basically, he builds out the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if you guys don't know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is basically like, you have at the bottom, like survival, right? Like food, sex, shelter. Then you have like friendship. And then you like keep building your way up. Like you start to have like luxury things. And then the top of the pyramid is self-actualization. And so he actually applies that to business. And so um, basically, we took our product and go like, at the base level, what is our product? Like it's something that's more than meets the eye. We use high quality materials like titanium and it's got subtlety and it's, we use really high end stuff. It's basically like, that's what it is. It's a pair of sunglasses at the bottom. At the, at the next level up, the social level, like we're bringing people and experiences together. Like when you're at a party or you're out doing something, like you get to be a provider. And like you're doing fun things, essentially. And then at the highest level, as a person, you are more than meets the eye. Like you, you represent something more. And so you, that's how you build your brand and you start identifying those things all the way through and uh, it allows you to build the values in the company. And, and our values are, are basically, one of each founder got to name a value. So mine was unique, because that's something I'm really passionate about. Um, Patrick's was trust. He wanted our product to be super trustworthy, like it, it's not gonna fail you ever. Um, Dempsey's was iconoclastic, uh, meaning like you break the rules. Like he's the guy that broke his foot climbing off of American Apparel at night. Um, and Zach's was depth, like bringing the people element into it, right? And like my whole life, my dedication is bringing people and experiences together. And like that's really what I get to do with William Painter. I get to go out and travel the world and do fun things. And I get to meet cool people that have amazing stories. So like really we've identified the company and now the company is in line with us and it's very authentic. So that's kind of bringing the Maslow's hierarchy needs thing together. Skills to master? Uh, I mean, my skill is really like bringing people on to help with the stuff that I don't know anything about and I don't know very much. So I'm constantly like building on these people to help me. So that's probably the most important skill. When you have someone, like for example, like China manufacturing, like I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about sunglasses. But like I found all these people to help me like build that. And so you need those people in your life and there's no way to do it without them. So that's probably like the biggest one. And then I think just being an optimist is really important, because <laughs> you're gonna get punched in the face a few times, for sure. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, when you were doing the Rainbow Shoes deal? Like, yeah. kind of how you developed that relationship, even with the VP of sales, and kind of how that whole thing transpired? Right, yeah, so. More in depth. Business is, is about people, right? And so, that's how we built the cornerstone of that company. It, uh, basically, I was at San Diego State, I was shopping around these little foldable sandals to different people. My little bro in Delta Sigma Pi uh, was friends with the guy at Rainbow, 
And so I was just talking to him about stuff, and he actually ended up telling his mom. His mom's friend with the CEO, like they do consulting together. His mom told the CEO, and the CEO was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Like, let's, let's just have him in and talk to Don and like talk to VP and see what happens. And like the skill set that I learned at my job, I was in sales, and so we used a project overview where we basically listen to the customer, write down all their needs, and then kind of like throw our needs in there and then put it back on them. Like that's essentially what we did with Rainbow for like a year. We're like, what do you guys need? Like, what, is, what do you need for this to work? And like, here's what we need for it to work. And then that's how we kind of built that process. So at the end, it's something that they were happy with and we were happy with. Uh, you talked about Junto. Uh, Junto. Are yeah. you guys looking forward to like expanding to other cities, like further east? And yeah, like, definitely. What, what, what are you looking forward in like, in like other chapter and you know, in other cities and. Yeah, uh, Junto is something that is very difficult to replicate. It's it's very organic and like it's very values based, right? So it's like it started super small. Like there was three guys that showed up every Friday at the beginning, and we just kept going. You know, like basically I forced those three guys to go. Like I was like, you have to go, and they're like, oh, okay. So they went, and then you know they kept going, and they were just like, why are we here? Like what what is the point of this? There's only three of us. Like. And then one more guy came, and then one more guy came, and one more guy came, and now it's like we have to split the meeting in half. And now there's multiple chapters, but it took a really long time to get there, and it's going to be a very slow growth. It's going to be like five, ten years to growing that out because you have to have the values, and that's it's so important. That's why I wanted you guys to write down your values because you need to understand yourself, you need to understand other people, because if one guy doesn't have the values, it ruins the whole meeting. And those guys get weeded out really fast. Some guys will break in somehow, like one guy will invite them, and they'll come in, and like they literally leave because it's like they are, their values are exposed right away, and they don't even realize it. It's kind of sad, you know. They're like, "Oh, I did this thing, and I like conned Groupon and did this, and I got a bunch of free stuff." And it's like, "Cool," and everyone's like, "Dude, you're an asshole!" Like, get the fuck out. Like, so it like kind of weeds them out, I guess. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, there's not a lot of factories that can actually do titanium. We're actually the one, the second one to do it. Um, so there's only like five, I think. Um, and basically, I found a guy that knew what he was doing over there. He's been doing it his whole life. He does um, all the sourcing for Groupon, Living Social. They, um, they're all moving into physical products now. So he goes out and finds the factory and produces it and manages all the logistics. And so we use that guy. And he found the factory and our quality assurance guy. So they make sure that the product's good, and I go over there and make sure it's good too. I'm actually, like our latest big challenge, right? So as an entrepreneur, every single day you have a new problem, and it's like a completely different problem. You're like, how many problems can there possibly be? Like it's so many different variables, and I think that's why they can't teach you entrepreneurship in school. It just can't work. There's just so many things that'll hit you from out of nowhere. So like the past two weeks, our sales like 30-folded, essentially. So. Now we're out of, like basically out of inventory. We got like 10 days left. So I gotta figure out how do we fix that problem because you go from selling a certain amount to a huge amount, like overnight. It's like, you gotta fix that. So we, when we did the brand transition from Liquid Shades, we still had a little bit left. We have like 500 left. So I'm actually flying to China on Tuesday. I found out yesterday. Flying to China on Tuesday with sunglasses in my suitcase, getting them switched over and sending them back um, on Tuesday. So I'm gonna be doing like a 24 hour trip to China and back playing FedEx. So it's like those kind of things like, and when you don't have money, you get super creative with it. And I think that's so important. Like not having money is, is really good because you don't get, you're not lazy. You're just like, oh yeah, like just make more, or do whatever. Like we can find little ways to like shortcut things. And I think that's really like those little shortcuts add up after a while and you make a really big company. Do you have an exit strategy? Yes, so the sunglass market's really interesting. 90% uh, of it's owned by Luxottica. It's an Italian group that own everything. They own the factories, they own all the stores, so Sunglass Hut, they own Len Crafters, they own the prescription market, they own the brands, they own the whole thing, every direction. Um, and so they are a pretty suitable um, acquirer. But we may just keep doing William Painter and expand it out to doing a lot more than sunglasses. Um, we have a really innovative team. I think part of our innovation comes from the fact that we just don't know it's not possible. Like, a lot of big brands have tried to do this, a lot. I mean, Spy and Von Zipper, like, had 
full hands on deck, five hour meetings with their entire company, yelling at them, saying, how can these kids do that? Like, that's not, shouldn't be possible. And so they met with us and they try to intimidate us and they do all these bully tactics and they bring in prototypes that they're working on and be like, hey, check these out. I'm like, all yours are broken. Like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, I think that there's a lot more that we can grow. Um, I could see us being kind of like a Volcom of the space, being just a you know, $500 million company. I know the founder of Volcom, he wears our glasses, so you know, I think that we have those advisors to be able to scale there, and especially with Kyle, the guy from LifeProof, like he knows the formula to, to grow. One more question. Oh, we were kind of bad at that at the beginning. We, uh, we were going on Kickstarter and we had to figure out what you're gonna do. And um, we set it low, like too low. And basically we were on the phone with, I think we said it, we were gonna do retail at 90. And um, titanium glasses are not cheap to make. We use the highest quality of everything. There's a lot of technology in it actually. We powder coat the arms like a mountain bike and then underneath it we anodize it like the iPhone 5. So that's anodizing. So like if you scratch through the paint, it's still black. Um, so the, all those things add up to cost, right? And if you price too low, then the perception of quality is not there. So people are like, how can you do titanium sunglasses for $90? They must be crap. So we raised it up, we've almost doubled it to 150. I still think that's low, um, considering the market. Uh, we were gonna go on Kickstarter, so basically with Kickstarter you have to discount. Good catch. Uh, you have to discount your product, right? So we were gonna do like $50 on Kickstarter, which is like insane. Um, we would have gone bankrupt for sure. And I was ready to launch, like two days before we were launching. And I call uh, the CEO of Lost Clothing, it's like a big action sports company, and I was like, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what it's gonna be. He's like, you're gonna go bankrupt. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up doubling the price, we went on for 90 on Kickstarter, stole a bunch, and then now we're at 150, and it'll probably go upwards from there um, with future lines, but uh, you gotta start somewhere. And, I think that we easily compete with Ray-Ban and those companies in terms of quality, or if not, way better. And uh, our future goal is to kind of upset the industry. Like, we, in some ways, we don't really care how much it costs because we're just driving quality and we have all these awesome connections in China where we literally have unlimited innovation. Like, whatever we want to do, we can do. And so uh, we're pushing, like, in packaging, we're going to be the best packaging. We're, like, we're going to be like the apple of packaging, the apple of quality, we don't, we're not going to do a million styles. It's going to be the ones that are very simple and easy to sell. Um, we're actually coming out with a little golden screwdriver. It's going to go in every case. Uh, so people are going to tighten their glasses. And it's just something different. We're just going to keep pushing and keep pushing. And um, that's how we, we make it different. Thank you, guys.